Hey, Mushroom Nerds, Anna McHugh here. Uh, I am sitting next to a really beautiful, a cool weather specimen of Pleuratus austriatus, the uh, oyster mushroom. So I'm gonna talk about uh, how to find and identify those mushrooms, also explain to you how I'm going to make mushroom jerky later today, and then a couple of other things that I found. Uh, but before I do, if you like this uh, t-shirt, it has Lactarius indigo species group on it. Um, I have a website with some of my original art, uh, including this piece, it's mushroomanna.com. So if you feel like uh, supporting the channel or sending someone a very, very nerdy gift, uh, mushroomanna.com is where to do that. All right, so let's move on to our agenda for the, the day. Uh, first of all, you know, this is just a really beautiful pair of these mushrooms, and they're growing out of a hardwood stump, you can see here, and it's pretty well decomposed. So you'll find oyster mushrooms growing on wood. That is their deal. They are a decomposer. I'm going to harvest one of them. Oh, I think they're going to come out together. Oh my gosh just look at this. So these uh, mushrooms are just in beautiful condition and that's one of the things I love about oyster mushrooms that start to uh, fruit in the fall and the winter time. So you know you'll find oyster mushrooms, uh, Pleuratus austriatus and a couple of other species throughout the year really and uh, you know you start to see a lot of uh, sort of uh, darker brown or tan colored oysters that start to come out in the fall and winter. And, uh, you know, again, they can get really large without starting to get eaten by bugs, without, uh, you know, throwing too many spores loose. So this is just a magnificent specimen. Uh, but I'll let me uh, show you how to identify it really quickly if you're not familiar. So uh, Pleuratus austriatus is uh, part of the Pleuratus genus, and that contains a couple of other types of oyster mushrooms. But this is probably the most, like, uh, for the genus, I would say the iconic, you know, species for it. Uh, anyway, so what you have is sort of a scallop-shaped mushroom, oftentimes much smaller than this, growing on wood, and, uh, you know, oftentimes you'll have uh, clusters or sort of rosettes of them that will come up. In this case, I just have, oh my gosh, they're really also very, very tough and fleshy. All right, here, let me see. So in this case, we have, you know, two really pretty large mushrooms sort of layered on top of one another attached to a stump. When you flip the mushroom over, you will see a gilled surface that is nice and blade-like. And then also these gills are decurrent, meaning they run down the stem. So they're kind of a, you know, creamy pale color. And, uh, you know, the spores are white and very numerous. And so when you have an oyster mushroom that starts to drop its spores, you'll very frequently see a large amount of spore deposit on other fruiting bodies nearby. So like if you have a, um, and that's one of the reasons, you know, this is a really nice specimen is even though these are quite large, they haven't started to drop spores yet. So under a lot of normal circumstances, I would expect to see the top of this mushroom just covered in white powder. So anyway, you have these decurrent gills, nice and creamy, white spore deposit. It has a nice sort of, um, you know, almost uh, like fruity meaty aroma. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but certainly there's a bit of, um, you know, I guess pl the very plausibly seafood. And that's one of the reasons I think that it got the, uh, you know, common name oyster mushroom, in addition to its very, you know, oyster shaped appearance when, uh, you know, it, it comes and, and sort of uh, fans out off of the side of, um, it's substrate, so, you know, whatever wood it's growing on. And to that point, you'll oftentimes find oyster mushrooms that have way less of a stem than this one. And, you know, typically it's just more of a, like, little blobby knot, and it will uh, basically attach to the side of the wood, and then you'll have the oyster mushroom sprouting off of it. And for that reason, a lot of oyster mushrooms have this sort of, like, half-circle look to them, as opposed to being a mushroom that, you know, is uh, circular or an oval, something similar. So, um, that is Pleuratus austriatus, really abundant, and uh, I think when I first came to North Carolina, I was not spending a lot of time around oak trees because I was in the Pacific Northwest, so it was all Douglas fir mushrooms all the time, and I went on a New Year's Day walk with my mom and my brother, and they were so very patient because I just sort of discovered mushrooms, and these massive oyster mushrooms were everywhere. Uh, we were in Chapel Hill, and you know, that's a very, um, you know, oak-heavy city, and uh, so it was a really, uh, you know, great 
experience and sort of got me in the uh, mindset of enjoying uh, the mushrooms that live in North Carolina in the cooler months because it's also a really wonderful time to go out mushroom hunting because the weather is nice. All right, so final remarks on this. This mushroom is actually fairly tough and also because it's so large and has so much gill, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to take it home and make it into mushroom jerky. So the instructions for doing this more or less, and there's a lot of different, um, you know, combinations of marinades that you can make, but, uh, you know, it is recommended that you use something acidic. So in my case, I'm going to do something, uh, more like on the, um, vinegar side of things. So I'm going to take this home and cut it up and then I'm going to parboil it for a couple of minutes. Usually, you know, in a lot of my mushroom recipes start with like, I take it home, I clean it well, and then I parboil it for a couple of minutes and then move on from there. And that always like kills absolutely everything. It makes the mushroom, you know, uh, oftentimes will help it retain its internal water. So when you cook it in other ways, it will actually retain some of its, you know, bite to it. So anyway, I'm going to do that. Then I will uh, take my sliced up mushroom and put it in a marinade uh, probably you know overnight I think I'm gonna do so uh, anyway I'm going for sort of a teriyaki type of thing so I'll probably do some rice vinegar I have I think some uh, sesame teriyaki sauce probably sitting around the house and uh, then I will dehydrate them um, I'm going to go with about 160 degrees. You can go lower, but I have an oven that has, uh, you know, a floor that's 160 degrees for dehydration. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, you know, a lot of people, they will use uh, more like Southwest or sweet smoky styles of marinades. So you have a lot of ones that are based on, uh, you know, maple syrup and a little bit <clears throat> of, um, like liquid smoke and those kinds of flavors. I'm also going to put in a good bit of, um, I think, flaked red pepper because I really, really like a spicy jerky or a spicy anything. So anyway, these oyster mushrooms really delighted. I mean, just but you know, it's kind of um, not a great day for mushrooms. I'm just not finding very much, but taking home what I have here will give me more than enough to uh, enjoy for in the next couple of days at least. So I'm sawing them up. All right, so uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is the pear-shaped puffball. The Latin name for this is Apioperdon pyriforme, and uh, api and apioperdon, let's break down uh, the scientific name here. So api uh, is in reference to how this puffball, this type of, uh, you know, puffball fungus attaches to wood. And that's kind of an unusual feature. So puffballs, you have a lot of different species of them. Some are, are quite large in the Calvatia genus, and some are quite small. And there's a lot of them in this genus called Lycoperdon. And they tend to be, you know, small and dainty, uh, um, you know, um, small and dainty puffball mushrooms, but apioperdon, which is, it used to be in lycoperdon, apioperdon is a small puffball mushroom that grows, again, attached to wood. And very frequently, it's like really highly decomposed. You can see like where I collected this from was a fallen log where actually parts of it had become uh, dirt already. So they go after really well decomposed wood. And you'll oftentimes see, you know, huge colonies of them. Um, and, you know, they're kind of dainty but at the same time, they just have such a delightful uh, poof of spores. So they have, you know, these are obviously <clears throat> too old to take home or eat or anything like that. But as the fruiting bodies get older, so they start out and they're kind of like this um, ambiguous little ball and they, the outer uh, surface here, uh, the, you know, the skin as you, if you will, is really tough, but on the inside it's nice and firm and white. And that's when you can actually like collect and eat these mushrooms. But at a certain point in time that, um, you know, white material turns a sort of greenish tan color and becomes spore material. And, uh, you know, you have this still like kind of brownish, uh, you know, resilient, uh, outer skin, but on the inside you have all your spores and a little, uh, aperture develops here so that you can, uh, you know, if water goes in there, it will turn into a goo and then be dispersed. Or if, uh, you know, you're me and you're poking and prodding at it, then the spores will poof everywhere. Other features for identifying this, it has a really uh, interesting habit of developing these very big bits of mycelium. Those are called rhizomorphs. So root, uh, root looking is basically what that means. Uh, so, you know, the, um, 
apioperdon, as I was saying, is attached to wood and then perdon is fart. So this is the attached to wood fart pear-shaped uh, puffball and uh, pyriforme, which is the um, you know species epithet, means pear-shaped. So uh, I really enjoyed sort of unpacking that and you know the um, let's see uh, pear-shaped attached wood fart mushroom. I'm getting there. I haven't really figured out the right way to construct it, um, you know, in English. But anyway, a really fun little mushroom to find. Uh, even though, you know, I don't eat puffballs very frequently, but they are quite tasty. Um, and, you know, you just want to make sure that uh, the inside of the puff puffball is nice and white and firm. Kind of like tofu, you don't see any features on the inside of that mushroom either. It's very important to note that, um, you know, uh, Amanita mushrooms that can be quite dangerous. Some of them uh, will form in little eggs of tissue and they can look like a puffball that is just a little blob of mushroom tissue. So, you know, if you cut one open and it's nice and firm and there are no features, you're in puffball territory. If you open it up and there are any features at all or any kind of like, you know, patterning on, in, on the inside, you're dealing with a different critter. Uh, you know, it could be an Amanita. There are also like these unusual sclerodermas and and uh, rise of pogon, so other mushrooms that grow on the ground or a kind of puffball looking uh, that you don't necessarily want to eat. Uh, in conclusion, I'm going to just share with you a mushroom that I thought this was going to actually be uh, a little uh, tremella. So basically what I have here is an itty bitty teeny tiny little winter hedgehog mushroom. I can't even show very well, unfortunately. I wanted to there we go. That's a little bit better. So you can see I've got little teeth here. I got a little bit of orange yellow staining. It is a uh, kind of worn out, but I actually collected this. I didn't know what it was, uh, but I thought it was maybe, you know, witch's butter, which is sort of this slimy orangey thing. Um, and I had no idea that it was actually a uh, hedgehog mushroom. And, um, you know, I'm delighted to find it and I'm kind of sad I collected it, but I'm going to leave it here because even though hedgehogs are my favorite edible, not in that condition nor that size. Um, last words and remarks. I hope you're having a wonderful uh, remainder of your mushroom season. I do want to share with you these beautiful turkey tails. I've been talking at, you know, not great length, but I have talked a couple of times about how when the weather gets cooler, turkey tail, Trimedes versicolor, can oftentimes take on nice bluish tinging. And although though this is more like a slate gray with little hints of blue, this is what I'm talking about. So you'll oftentimes find, you know, turkey tail, which is just this delightful, colorful little character we find growing on wood all year long. Um, you know, in the summertime, it's often like brown and tan and sometimes really gets a lot of algae on it and it turns green. But in the cooler months, it takes on these uh, much more sedated wintry colors oftentimes. And so that's one of my, th one of the things I love a bluish turkey tail. So I'm delighted to find it. I am hopeful that you're well and we'll talk again next time.